Okay, well, the, the, the panel, and I think uh, Joanne kind of laid, uh, laid, laid a foundation for fiber and some of the physiological effects, and I think, um, I think we all agree that at some level, um, what's, you know, laxation is great, and oftentimes it's some of the fibers that aren't being fermented are providing that benefit, but a lot of the benefits are coming from the microbiota and microbial fermentation. So I guess my task, when I was talking to the, the, the um, the, the steering committee and there are certain people anyway in which I'd like to thank for inviting me to speak. Uh, my task is kind of to define, you know, go over some of the recent findings in, in the microbiome space because the next couple of speakers are going to really dive down and, and talk specifically and so I know other people in the room could probably give a, a better talk on this topic than I can but I'm going to try to do what I can in about 20 minutes here to, to uh, cover some of, of the uh, of the recent findings and, and what, what kind of where we're going in the future, I think, at least from my perspective. And so uh, I have a lot of conflicts of interest. I was not uh, paying attention when I sent this in. This is about the last decade, so I'm not working with all these people now, but in the past and ongoing, I have a lot of, uh, whether it's in industry-sponsored research, um, I guess I didn't put NIH up here, but I have some, some federal funding as well, but uh, human and animal nutrition uh, funding or private consulting, there's a lot of companies and many of the representatives in the room. So. Um, I'm going to dig right, you know, jump right into the microbiome and whether you're reading uh, top scientific journals or popular press or just looking through the, 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 uh, the book aisle or something, if you're in an airport and looking, there, there's microbiome everywhere. And so um, I think everyone, there's, there's great excitement uh, in this area now. And so certainly fiber plays into that, but it, it's being uh, not only applied to the gastrointestinal tract, to, but to metabolic syndrome and obesity and diabetes, all the way to mood and behavior. And so um, there's, there's, there's great excitement, and I'm going to put a, an embarrassing picture up on the next slide, and that's of myself. And so. Um, one thing I'll just say, this is me growing up on a farm, and Joanne mentioned that as well, and you learn a lot of things and right away, and I'll just say that the, the, long, the long skinny legs are still here, but I, I tend to think I dress better than I did back then, but <laughs> it, maybe that's uh, it's still a, a point of contention. But um, when you grow up on a farm, you might not understand what's really what's going on, at, certainly at the molecular level, and my, my father still doesn't know that, but you learn how to, how to manage animals, how to feed animals, and you know what? keeps them healthier to limit disease. You know what makes them grow faster and, and really from a performance perspective. And so if you think about the importance of the microbiota, if you grew up on a farm or you're an animal scientist or, or actually dealing with many of the people in this audience where we're thinking about fi dietary fiber, we know the microbiota is very important for, and it has been for a long time and we've realized that. We have a lot of new tools, but a lot of the questions we're asking is, are not really that new. And so we know that there's, there's especially in a ruminant animal, where they, you know, Joanne gave the, the stats where they really rely on uh, fermentation for energy. Um, the microbiota are key there, breaking down the fibrous substrates, the roughages that they're consuming, and then the outcomes really, or the outputs are milk production, meat production, uh, but still we have that morbidity, mortality in there as well. So certainly we know that's important, not just for animals, but for us. If we take that one step further, again, we know the early colonization of the gastrointestinal tract by the microbiota is really important in the development of the gut immune system and kind of that, the, the, the the maintenance of the immune system and really important, the commensal bacteria are important for pathogen resistance, whether it's producing short chain fatty acids or decreasing the pH or producing bacteria sins. You know, there, there's, a, there's a battle going on all the time and the good guys, you're, you're hoping the good guys are winning and that's really where we have a stable microbiota and that's really important. Um, and again, this concept, even though we know much more now today than we did 100 years ago, uh, Elie Metchnikoff, who's a, a Nobel laureate, um, you know, you know, observed in, in, in Bulgarian peasants that people eating fermented foods were had you know a higher health status and longevity versus those eat and not. And so a lot of these things we've we've observed for for many many years. We just um, oftentimes haven't had the tools. And I apologize. I wasn't sure how big the, the slide the screens would be here. Um, this is a. a, a a figure from one of Harry Flint's papers from a few years ago, really kind of thinking about microbiota as, as a balance. So we want, we want everything to always shifted toward the good side, of course, but whether you're think, thinking about the microbiota and in, in the center here, if you can't read it, uh, the different microbial products and activities that the microbial um, uh, populations are doing. So short chain fatty acids, vitamin synthesis, whether you're uh, pushing toward cancer prevention or cancer promotion, depending on, again, what bacteria you have there, what substrates they're metabolizing. 
and, and what metabolite, uh, metabolites are being absorbed by the body uh, can really push you one way or the other. And so it goes all, all the way down from really supplying energy and nutrients, cancer prevention or promotion, uh, inhibiting or, or promoting pathogens, uh, gastrointestinal immunity, gut motility, cardiovascular health. The list really goes on and on. And it's this, again, this balance that we, that we have. And so I think fiber, it definitely plays a role in, in, in that balance. And so uh, we'll hear again the next couple of days. That's why we're here. Um, what really has limited us is the, is the tools that we've had available. And we have a lot of new tools. It's really exciting. And I'm going to go over some of that. Um, no tool is perfect. We need a combination. It's already been mentioned today. And it's been mentioned the last couple of days at an NIH meeting. I think we need a combination of tools all the way from the cell up, up to community and the ecosystem, really. Uh, but the, the questions that, that we still have oftentimes is how do you identify bacteria? How do you culture them? How do you study their function? So what, what are they doing? And in the past, it's really the resolution, the sensitivity, uh, the methods were really laborious, and we didn't have a good handle on that. And so I think the excitement in the last 10 years here, especially um, with the, the 10th year uh, anniversary of the HMP, Human Microbiome Project, is in a couple months. So they, again, NIH has a, a symposia in, in the middle of August kind of celebrating that and, and kind of thinking, OK, here's the last 10 years. What do we, where do we go from here? And, Again, the last, the, the first uh, 10 years, um, it, we've, we've learned a lot as a, as a research community and, and people um, doing a lot more of it than, than, than me, but um, I think for a lot of big projects or whether it's in science or you just want to sell a pair of sh new shoes and get your brand going, there's a tipping point. And I think some, some of these things build up and it's hard to predict, but when it comes to things like the HMP, um, there are a lot of things I think that kind of everything came to a head and it's all about timing and, and, and things as well. And so really the cost, the decrease in cost, the increase in speed with the next generation sequencing techniques that, that we have now or were developed um, really was very important. That was, that was key. Another thing that was key is the computing power. If you can generate a lot of data but you can't interpret it, it really limits you and you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. There's really no point in, in going through the effort. And so the computing power, the bioinformatics that we, that we had uh, really is important. But really I think what pushed it over the top is that Again, if you might, a lot of us in the room, we, we acknowledge how important the microbiota have been. And being that this is the 11th Mahoney Conference, you know, people in this room know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. But it was at some other level that, that you start looking at some of the germ-free studies that Jeff Gordon's lab and others uh, started performing, where you take fecal inocula from an obese animal and put it into a, 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 a germ-free mouse, and they gain more weight than, than inocu those that are inoculated with, from a lean mouse. And so, and they also showed some, some from twin studies, this microbiome phenotypic relationships that really, I think, got people excited. And that was, was part of that tipping point, and then the floodgates kind of opened. And so about 10 years ago, that's really when HMP started, uh, Meta hit in Europe, uh, and then BGI in China. And so there's a lot of people now, again, we're on the second or third phase of a lot of these huge, huge huge uh, uh, initiatives, um, and, it, and it's really exciting. And so what do we have to work with today? Um, this, this figure, if you can't read it again, there's, there's really uh, three different things I'm going to touch on here from a molecular perspective. And one, you have questions of who is there, what can they do, and then what are they doing? I think those are key questions we still have. Uh, but who is there is the first thing, and that's, I would argue, probably the easiest thing to do even though it's still relatively complicated. But what bacteria are there? And so the 16S rRNA gene is usually that gene that, that we use for, for, phy, uh, for phylogenetic mapping. And so really, you can identify who is there. The second one is, what can they do? So it's, it's not just, OK, who is there? Let's look at all the genes. What can they metabolize? And so you know, Eric, coming up next, is going to go through in, in great detail of some of the methods and the great things you can do at a molecular basis to predict what can they do. And then, and then you need to test, OK, can they really digest what they think we think they can digest or what they can metabolize. And so whether you're looking at the DNA, the RNA, the protein or metabolite level, you can do that. And so that's pretty exciting. And then you really need to take it one step further. And so whether it's in vitro or in vivo, looking at phenotyping and what effect does that have? Can we predict what we think is going to happen? And so, and then kind of validating that. And so again, using all these tools at one, at one, at one point. And some people, uh, if you're like me, I, I might take, try to do a couple of these things. You know, the, the super labs that are out there, they're, they're doing all this and combining these, these big data sets together. But as a community, a research community, I think we're really making, making uh, good progress here. Uh, but it is very complicated, so it's really not that easy. Um, so what did we, you know, the first, 
the, the major objectives or the, or the outputs from these microbiome projects the, in the initial 10 years. I think first, really a main goal was to have this reference set of, of microbio, uh, microbial genomes. So what is, who is there, what, what capacity do they have? And so starting in 2007, a lot of these papers started coming out 2009, 2010, 2011, and a lot of the gene catalogs, it was pretty impressive that, you know, our genome has 22, 23,000 genes. If you look at the microbiome or the metagenome, all the microbiome genome, uh, micro, microbial genomes together, they have over 3 million genes, so over 150 times the number of genes that we have. And so they can metabolize things that we have, we have no, no way of doing, and that's part of the, the importance of the symbiosis that, that we have. And so there's a lot of potential that's there. Um, again, part of the, the HMP was, was to, okay, again, manage this, this data set. We just can't have one big super lab in, in, in the U.S. or around the world that handles all the data. We, and there were people like Rob Knight and others that, that developed software that then a lot of the, the simple-minded person like me, if, which I, I don't know how to do this, but I have a good postdoc or students that know how to, how to interpret the data and crunch the, the numbers. How can you annotate the, the sequence data you get into what bacteria are there, what genes are there? How can you visualize it instead of just having a big spreadsheet with numbers and letters and it doesn't make any sense? So there's a lot of software uh, and programs that were developed and kind of conceptual ideas and we're, that's still an evolving area as well, but that's an, an important part of it. Of course, the whole goal is to look at health and disease. And so um, there, there are, and there's this one figure here looking at a dysbiosis index. And so there's, there's people looking at a healthy state, a disease state. It's difficult to uh, you know, really prove causality and that's a big issue in this whole field. Uh, but at least you can start making associations here and then give you ideas for further uh, targeted uh, experiments later on. So that certainly uh, has, is, has been done and is still being done. And then most of us, or a lot of us here, whether it's dietary fiber or some other dietary or drug intervention, whether it's prevention or treatment, how does that play a role? And so all these things are kind of going together and we're, we still can continue to move forward in that regard. And so if we're understanding microbial metabolism, again, you probably can't read these either, but in, in, these, in these bubbles here are just, this is a figure again from, from a recent publication, um, looking at the different bacterial groups and what they metabolize and all the cross-feeding that goes on. And so there's the, the, the colors there are redox potential as well, but we're thinking about fiber oftentimes. But there are other, other fermentable substrates. There are sugars and sugar alcohols that might play a role, proteins and lipids, and then of course a lot of the endogenous secretions, mucin being one key one that we'll hear uh, really soon. But endogenous, exogenous substrates and what cross-feeding is going on. You can look at bacteria by themselves and that, and that will give you some in, uh, information that, that can be useful, but really once you start putting them into a community, there's that dynamic there. there there's, there's competitive advantages that some bacteria have, and it depends on what they're consuming, what's available to them, they'll have an advantage or they won't, and so that's, that's pretty key. Another thing is measuring, I think, active active bacteria, not just measuring at a DNA level. We need to go beyond that. DNA, and we do that, I'm, I'm guilty of that as well. It's the easiest thing to do. Take the DNA, measure who is there, and then say, try to make implications uh, from that. But it's very, it, it doesn't really tell you everything, and it sometimes can bi um, bias your understanding or uh, make it really a gray area and it'd be difficult to interpret. So um, what metabolites are being produced, what genes are present or being expressed, all these things are, are pretty important. Um, another thing is, again, that at the NIH meeting this, this week, and, and it's already been mentioned here, really clearly identifying what is being consumed. So have a good handle on what diet, uh, whether you can control diet. If you can't control diet in a lot of the human studies, it's very hard to control people. Probably the hardest studies to do are human studies, right? And so, uh, if, but if you can't control it, at least can you get good, good data on what are, is being consumed. So maybe you don't have as much control, they're free living people, uh, but, but you can measure what's being consumed. So certainly the fiber, the resistant starches, oligosaccharides are important, but we've seen in some of our animal studies, if you can really shift it from carbohydrate to protein fermentation, you'll see huge, huge shifts in, in the activity, but even the taxonomic groups that are, that are there. Um, of course, phytonutrients, this is with the polyphenolics and other compounds are, are starting to get more attention all the time, but our focus is usually on the macronutrients, and I think it's complicated enough there, and then in my opinion, I, again, I want to, not that I always take the easy way out, but I, it, it's way more complicated to get now into the polyphenols and all the other micronutrients that are there too, so, but we can't forget about those. Um, and again, then we have the mucus, but bile and other secretions that, that can impact 
um, the, the substrate load or the activity of the bacteria. And so um, this figure on the bottom really talks about, again, uh, cross-feeding, that there's certainly there are some primary degraders uh, that, and a lot of the bacteroidetes are really impressive with the gene sets they have. They can metabolize all kinds of things. But then we have some bacteria that are very specific and are specialized that really need those, uh, those primary degraders to, to be able to survive and to prosper in the, in the gut. And so there, there's, again, there's a lot of cross-feeding and a lot of symbiosis, not only with the host, but with other bacteria and kind of working together to break down uh, these products. And so very quickly, it's already been mentioned, but I'll just say, you know, really comparing carbohydrate versus protein fermentation, um, the short-chain fatty acids are the key outcome that most people are, are concerned about. There's some gases, of course, and if you're, you know, some of, some of the, the fibers or oligosaccharides, it's very important to know how much gas versus short-chain fatty acid is going to be produced um, because you, you, you want the, the, probably the short-chain fatty acid, you, you want the butyrate, you want other things, but you don't want a ton of gas to come with that. And so definitely you have to be careful there. But the short-chain fatty acid benefits not only an energy source, Joanne already mentioned the, the decrease in pH that can be helpful in pathogen resistance, but also uh, increasing mineral absorption. So calcium and magnesium, some really nice studies have been published recently on that and looking at bone density in, in uh, adolescent uh, uh, girls and, 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 and other life stages as well, but certainly that's important. And then lastly, a gut peptide synthesis, GLP-1, GLP-2, PYY, the list goes on and on, that the short-chain fatty acids really are functioning as secondary messengers and kind of kicking off um, some, some pathways there, but then these gut peptides are then having effects, uh, again, outside the gut. So there's effects in the gut, but then um, outside as well. And so it's really difficult to kind of track all these things and what's going on, but certainly the, the short-chain fatty acids are playing an important role there. There. Uh, if you flip to the protein fermentation, and usually it's, uh, I don't want to be so negative, but usually we're trying to push for, for, uh, for fiber and carbohydrate fermentation. That's really what we're trying to do. Because a lot of nasty things are produced, and not that short-chain fatty acids smell, smell good. If you ever worked with them in the lab, if you get them on your skin, you're going to smell for a while, and just wait till the skin cells to slough off, and then you'll, you'll, it won't smell as bad. But they're really smelly, but there are some really putrefactive compounds that are produced from protein fermentation. And so really, I think the push is more toward carbohydrate fermentation. Again, uh, ammonia, the phenols and indols, sulfur-containing compounds, usually we're trying to keep those at a, at a minimum. Um, and they do have some association with disease. Uh, the causality is often not there, and that's, that's difficult to, 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 to prove sometimes, but I think in general we're, uh, we're trying to do that. Maybe, that's not, maybe there's exceptions to the rule, but I think we're usually trying to do that. Uh, I want to, again, my knowledge of the polyphenolics and what they're doing in regards to fermentation is very low, and so there's other people that can speak on that. But I wanted to not leave those out. There's been a lot done recently in this area, and I think it's an exciting area as well, that even if you're thinking about natural food components and whole grains and other things, I think you know the fiber certainly is important. We have resistant starches that are probably there, but there's a lot of other phytonutrients that are, that are there that are part of that matrix, and so the form is certainly in the processing are important in, in, in how we're consuming them. And so, again, very different food products that, that provide the polyphenolics. The last thing I'll say before I have a few wrap-up slides here is that, again, the, we all know the microbes aren't in a vacuum. The, they're, they're fermenting and doing their thing in the gut, but a lot of these metabolites are being absorbed. And so they might be absorbed and used for energy. If it's butyrate, a lot of that is used for energy in the clon by the clonocytes. But there might be other things that are that are module, uh, modified in, by the clonocyte, or they're going to be absorbed, they reach the liver, and the liver is now modifying them or using them either, either as an energy source or just trying to excrete those. And so I think the, the, one of the best examples is chronic kidney disease, that you have, you really don't hear about uremic toxins until, you have your, until your kidneys don't work right and, and you're clearing all these toxins. But if you have someone that really is going through a dialysis, you have a huge buildup of uremic toxins. So indoxyl sulfate is one that is often mentioned, but there's a whole host of these. And and we've looked at, again, high protein versus high carbohydrate diets in an animal model and see a huge inf change in the metabolomics, uh, metabolome in the, in, in the plasma. You can measure it in the urine, but in some of the feces, but certainly that dynamic completely changes. And again, in a healthy state, it's probably, probably not a problem. You can argue it, it, the animals that we were studying were perfectly healthy, but it was almost night and day. You could tell that the pattern was very different. And so in a diseased animal, that would be a huge problem. And so again, we have to, again, getting down to the metabolomics, the proteomics metabolomics area, I mean, it's you know, not, not just hundreds, but thousands of different metabolites, and it's very, very complicated. But again, it's, it's an important part of it. Um, I was asked, you know, Barbara, kind of said, you know, it, it, the, the last sentence of my abstract, I think, got me in trouble. I was like, you know, trying to apply this to health and disease. And this is always the, 
I don't know, I guess I need to get a new, new summary statement for my abstracts or, some, or my papers that more research is needed, right? That's what we're always saying. Well, how do we move forward? Because usually you use some of these big tech, the, the, the widespread techniques, you have more questions than answers at the, at the end of it. And maybe I shouldn't show all my cards, but I'm not that smart to figure this all out. And so usually I'm like, ah, we need more research to figure it out. Or I need better, you know, a, a bigger lab or smarter people to, to, to <laughs> keep me in line maybe is what, what the real answer is. But how do we move forward? And I so um, it's very difficult in people and I, I I, again, I agree with, um, I guess I, I got my, my PhD with George, so I agree with him quite a bit and other people that have mentioned animal models are key because we can go, we have to go beyond fecal samples, I think, at some level. And it's very difficult in people, uh, some animal models, it's still difficult as, uh, as well. But, um, you know, certainly the region of the gut, but even the mucosal versus the, the, the luminal bacteria are different. So making sure what, we, what samples we get, are they, are they relevant or are they really indi indicative of what we think they are? And so that's important. Uh, the value of fecal metabolites, again, is, is questionable. We measure fecal short-chain fatty acids all the time because if you don't, people are going to ask for it. But you really wonder, I mean, the great majority are of those that are produced are absorbed. So what you're left with is what was produced minus what was absorbed. So the value of that is, is least questioned. Um, and are there other outcomes or biomarkers? And this is a, an area where all the technologies, I think, we're, we're getting uh, closer to, to identifying those. Um, microbial genomics and culturing, I know I don't want to steal Eric's thunder. He's got a lot more uh, great data than, than I ever do in, the, in this area. But um, this is a figure at the bottom here really looking at arabinoxylan utilization and so a, a, a figure from a paper that uh, Harry Flint's lab came up with and they've done a lot of the similar work that at a molecular level what can these bacteria do? What genes do they have? What can they metabolize and then actually taking those not the, the genomics but now culturing them and see can they really do that? Can they metabolize this? And then really you'd have to bring it up to a whole system but now can they compete with the other bacteria there to, to do what we think they can do? Or are they going to be outcompeted because they have some disadvantage? And so, uh, but, but this is really again at the, at the molecular level, very exciting work and you read through science and nature and cell and all these other things and, and this is the type of work that's there because it's, it's really really novel and, and uh, really exciting. Um, from a, I think whether it's animal studies or human studies, longitudinal samples are key that we really need. There, there's some, if you see longitudinal sampling, usually it's early development. What's being developed, what microbes are inhabiting the gut early on in life, how does breastfeeding versus formula feeding affect this, and uh, maybe some other, you know, other, other dietary components, but I think with disease development and even in aging, longitudinal sampling is important. Um, I'm just going to make one comment about proper study design. We've already said, you know, parallel versus crossover designs. Um, or some people not even really thinking about design, that they, they start measuring things. And if you start with a bad experimental design that's biased, you really can't get yourself out of that hole. And so we have to be very, I think, intentional in everything that we do. Um, one of the other things, I'm, I'm on the, I guess I'm on more than a soapbox up here, but dietary control and dietary records are key, that we know what's going in. You still don't know what's going to be digested, what's actually reaching the colon and some, but you can at least have a predictor um, in some food groups that are important than if you know at least what's being consumed or trying to predict predict that. And we can argue about how good, which, which method of, of identifying uh, you know, how much people are eating is, uh, that can be kind of debated, but certainly if we're trying to do it at least, it is better than just ignoring it completely. And then lastly, as a community, I think collaboration is key, that we can't be expert in everything. And so uh, on some of the big projects that, that have, and, and some of the papers, really complicated papers, there's no nutritionist or a physiologist even on the paper. And, and sometimes I think we need to incorporate, and it's not, it doesn't have to be me, I'm not trying to self-promote here, but trying to really have multidisciplinary teams. And so we collaborate with biostatisticians and, and people that know a lot more about the microbes than, than our lab does. But we have to you know, really kind of, uh, I guess, try to get this as a whole uh, research community to do this. And then understanding animal versus human uh, models, because we can do a lot in animals that we can't do in humans. And then avoiding potential uh, sources of bias. And there's all kinds of things there too. But um, certainly we have to un have an understanding of, of the digestive physiology and, and nutritional status. And with that, I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions now or if you want to hunt me down after, after a break too, I'll be happy to talk to you. So thank you very much. So I'd like to invite any questions. We can take uh, probably two or three. So please uh, step to the mics. Anybody? People are either confused or scared <laughs> or, oh, or sleeping. I'm not no. sure. That's fine. <laughs> uh, 
Now let's see what's from Church and Dwight. Uh, if you'd like to see a uh, positive shift in the microbiome uh, and want to take a supplement approach, would you like to have a single uh, strain very well studied versus a uh, just a species level, uh, multiple uh, species uh, containing probiotic? From a probiotic, I, you know, I. There are people in this room that are probably much better, better suited to answer that question, but I tend to think we don't know enough about the bacteria to, have to think there's one magic bullet. I, I tend to think their dose is key, I think, uh, having, and having strains that are uh, important in the gut you're studying. So I think that that's been shown, uh, Jens Walter and other people recently have looked at from a probiotic perspective, I'm not sure if Jens is here, but um, almost, not that it has to be individual person, but certainly ha if you want to test a probiotic and people can argue with me or agree with me. Um, but I think choosing the strains you're choosing, but the dose certainly is important. And I think um, in general, I think the data, at least from an animal perspective, the data are usually, maybe it's a dose issue, I'm not sure, but there, there are some products that seem to have more efficacy and, and um, it's usually multi-strain, I think. Um, but that's just my, my opinion. I think it's, it's very... It's very difficult. I think you have to have, again, try to identify strains that, that um, are kind of at, at home in, in, in the human gut. If it's a human probiotic, if it's, an, if it's a, for a dog or a horse or something else, it might be a different strain, I think. But um, other than that, I probably can't give you any more detail. But, but um, I think certainly dose is important, and, and, and definitely what strains you're, you're choosing is, is very important. Yeah, since you brought this uh, dose uh, to the conversation, uh, what do you... Uh, when you see uh, 10 billion versus 100 million, 50 billion, the number is really a uh, marketing <laughs> uh, thing right now. Uh, but what do, you, what do you see, like, uh, is, is there a uh, uh, limit that you would like to see and the other amounts are not, not relevant? Because uh, you don't know, like, whether it's the 10 billion is the right dose, 50 billion, uh, 100 billion. I think it's really kind of like different fibers. It's a case-by-case -case basis, I, I think. And it could be life stage of the, of the host that you're targeting certainly is important. But certainly kind of the, the, the activity of that bacteria. So I think it would really come down to the data. You'd have to, you'd have to do, I mean, ideally a dose response to see um, what, what's needed. If you really look at, uh, you know, the mechanisms of the probiotics, how they're functioning, you think about the trillions and trillions that are in the gut already. And they already have their, their, their feet their foothold in there already. Trying to bounce them out is very difficult. So I think um, certainly competition for nutrients and some other you know factors. Their mechanisms are very complicated, but certainly even you know uh, probably microbe host interactions and identifying you know affecting the gut immune system and things like that. There's all kinds of mechanisms. So I think it's, it would be a case by case basis to really to to do that testing uh, because whether it's based on a strain or a dose, I think it all goes together. In my in my opinion, that it would have to be uh, just have the data to kind of back it up. Would be you know marketing just uh, because you have more. I don't think that's a good way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, Thank you. Sure. Okay. Yeah, let's go with Biofortis, and we do contract research with a lot of companies, and there's a big interest still. <coughs> in the term prebiotics, so I think this is a loaded question, but um, I just wondered your thoughts on that, because it used to be, like, we knew this definition, lacto, and now I, I don't know what it means anymore, so I wondered if you thought about if the term's going away, or if that's a, you know, how that choose, because consumers understand that. I mean, it, yeah, well, that's a, it's, I didn't even put her up to this, but we, um, uh, there's, there's been an, a recent prebiotic consensus panel, uh, really led by Glenn Gibson, Mary Ellen Sanders, Greg, uh, Gregor Reed, and many others. And I was, in, I was the quote unquote animal guy, I think, in the room on that, on that panel. But, and it's, it, it literally, just yesterday, I got the announcement that it's, it'll be a nature review, uh, hepatic, uh, gastroenterology and hep hepatology. And so it's, just, it's online now that that, that and, the, the issue has been that, that Glenn Gibson and, and others, you know, really Glenn, though, has kind of led the charge in the, the terming of prebiotic and what is a prebiotic, you know, over about 20 years ago now. And since then, there's been about 12 different definitions made, similar to dietary fiber. And so, it, I, kind of part of this consensus panel was, okay, for real now, this is what, what a prebiotic is. And so, it's kind of changing the definition a little bit, that it's not just bifido and lacto, there, it's, there's been a, a branching out. Under the new definition, there are things like polyphenolic should be, will be included included in there. Again, if you provide, you can show benefit there. And a key is you're still kind of selecting, I guess the, the, the discussion is, goes on and on with prebiotics, but it's still more selective, but it's not 
really define how selective it has to be, but that health benefit has to be there. And so that's, so the term I don't think is going away, um, the, but the controversy over the term probably won't go away either. So that's probably maybe not a good answer to the question, but I think, but certainly there's a new publication coming out that kind of tries to encompass a lot of the discussion around and the controversy around it. Um, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to cut questions. Okay. Oh. Oh. oh, just a bill. Great point. Thanks, Barbara. Thank and you. thank you, Kelly.